like finally last week, um, I felt like the Lord said, you know what, it's time to share this material. Um, so you're going to have to hang with me a little bit. I'm going to do a, quite a bit of reading. Um, and then the other thing is if you don't like psychology, you just may not like this session at all. I don't know. Um, I'm not really good at, um, if you've done real colors, you'll know that like my lowest color is green, which means I'm not very analytical. I'm not a good researcher. Um, but for some reason, I always perk up over psychology. And so um, I, when I came across this book, um, it's called Becoming a Family That Heals. In fact, Brother Ron Libby um, recommended this book to us several years ago. And um, I went through some of it at the time, like probably five years ago. And then when Pastor asked me to teach a course on it in the fall, I went through it all over again. And, it, and the second time through it, I really absorbed it a whole lot more. And I also started to do some of the things that they said. Um, so if you were in my life, life course, I apologize. This will be a bit of a repeat of probably like the first and second session, but um, I'm going to kind of combine the two sessions I did, which doesn't mean I'm about to go an hour and a half, so everybody breathe. Um, but I am going to do some reading because I just feel like sometimes, you know, to rephrase things and reword, it's just no point when somebody much smarter than me already wrote it. <laughs> so that's kind of the way I look at that. So this is the book um, from Becoming a Family That Heals. It's by Tom and Beverly Rogers, I believe. They are both psychologists, um, Christian psychologists. So I do urge you when you delve into psychology, it is important to have a biblical worldview when you're looking at it. It's very helpful because there's a lot of crazy stuff in the psychology world too. Imagine that. Wow, crazy stuff. Let's just say new age. I'll just call it what it is. Sometimes there's a, some some new age stuff that gets intertwined with some secular humanism and things like that in the psychology world. So I do urge you, if you do this kind of stuff, studying this kind of stuff, that try to do it from a, a biblical Christian worldview. So they are Christian psychologists. All right. So this book, basically, what I what I kind of like about it is it integrates psychological principles with biblical truths. So that's what I kind of like about the way they approach things. And there again, from the very beginning, I have stated that when you are trying to overcome hurts or failures, sometimes it could be, for example, Brother Green was telling us a testimony um, at our dinner table the other night that, um, you know, he went and prayed for somebody, the Lord revealed to him something from their childhood, he spoke that word, and it was like they had this instant deliverance or healing, okay? I absolutely believe that can be the case. I absolutely believe you could be at this altar. You could be at your seat. You could be in your living room, on the floor, in your bedroom. You could just whatever. And the Lord just take care of something right there, heal you. Absolutely. Sometimes, though, it's not always that simple, and I don't mean to say that meaning that the Lord is simple or something, but just sometimes things become a process to work through, to deal with. And so what I, my hope is that you leave this class feeling like you've been given a lot of tools, a lot of ways in which you can overcome some things in your life. All right. Another thing that tonight could reveal to you so I want everybody to be very careful. Um, it could condemn you. And here's what I mean by that. I'm going to talk about what happens when you're wounded and then what happens when you're triggered, when that wound gets triggered in your life. There's some of you in here with grown children gone out of your house. You might sit here and listen and be like, oh, I wish I knew that. 10 years ago. I wish I knew that when the kids were little. I wish I... And so this is what I'm saying. I don't want you to feel condemnation. That's not the will of God. Um, we learned about condemnation last week, and that is not the will of God. 
And so you've got to take this material and just realize, okay, Jesus, there's a reason why I just learned this tonight at, you know, whatever, 60 years old, my kids are grown and whatever, and, and you know, what have you. So I just want you to just remember that, um, that you just need to, all you can do is move forward from today. You cannot go back. You can't. All right. And there's no point in trying to rehash things or whatever. Now, if you hear all this and you felt and you feel convicted to perhaps go to your kids and apologize for something because you realize you did something where you may have wounded them. That's great. I mean, let the Lord move on you to do those things. But I don't want you to feel condemnation. So that's very important to me. The other thing I don't want you to do is nudge the person next to you and say that she's preaching to you. (laughs) Um, Because what happens also when I start to talk about these things is you're going to inevitably think about someone in your life who is like this. Or you're going to think about someone, it could be your spouse, it could be your parents, and you're thinking, ooh, like they need to hear this because this is like for them, you know, like... They really need this. Like, um, so what I don't want you to do is walk away from here weaponized. That's the last thing that teaching like this should do for you um, and should do in your marriage and in your family. Um, we say this in marriage seminars. Do not weaponize the material that we're giving you. Do not use it in an argument and say, well, Sister Angie said you need to go pray when that soul wound is triggered. You know, see what I'm saying? See, that's what, what, what I don't want to see, because that's not positive at all. That's not healthy family life. So take these things, take it and internalize them for you. But also, as you listen, you're going to recognize some people in your life. Oh, you guys need Esther. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, oh, bless her heart. It's just so sad. I just want to comfort her. I know. Sister Angie's going to give it to you, honey. I know your parents took it away, but yeah. All right. Oh, her sister did it. Okay. I'm going to give it back. I'm going to get it for you. You go in there and calm down. All right. So I don't want you to, um, to take it all that way, but I will encourage you that you can take some of this material and learn to have communication in your home. This is how it could look, okay? So Gus, maybe something just made you mad. Something Lauren did, and man, it just set you off, and you are just ticked off. And you are, I mean, I don't, I don't know you, Gus, so I'm just, I'm not picking on you. I don't know, maybe you get, maybe you yell. Maybe it's, and all of a sudden... And see, so what can happen? Now, this isn't every time, because sometimes it's just, it's just simple things. But if it's something really big, so what can happen is Lauren could say, your reaction is a little bit disproportionate. It's a little extreme considering what I just did. So do you think you might have a wound here that I kind of triggered? And see, so you can carefully talk to one another in a way that's very positive and can really help each other. Um, So in the same way, I don't want you to weaponize the material. You can also learn to talk this talk. Um, You know, might you have a, a soul wound here that's causing you to react this way? And, and sometimes that can be really helpful. All right. So, but you really got to be careful with that. You got to do it out of love and sincerity and really trying to help the other person. All right. So we're just going to dig right in. For the sake of simplicity, let's imagine that when we are wounded in childhood, these memories of these events, they form wrinkles on our brain. That's kind of crazy. A wrinkle on your brain, metaphorically speaking, the more traumatic the memory, the deeper the wrinkle or the groove. Childhood traumatic memories make the deepest grooves of all because the brain is still forming during this time, and the authors of this book call these painful memories soul wounds. All right, so that's not some weirdo term. And it makes a lot of sense as you go through, you'll understand why they call it a soul wound, because really, ultimately, 
if you just call it a wound and don't really recognize what it's really truly impacting, then you can't go to the source of strength that you need to heal that wound, which is God. God's the only person that can heal a wound in your soul, okay? So a soul wound. Sometimes in families or marriages, and now mind you, if you're not in a family or a marriage right now or whatever, try to just apply this to where you're at in your um, stage of life. But for the sake of not clarifying that every time I'm going to just say families and marriages, etc. All right. It could also be your friends. So think about your friendships. Think about those kinds of things. Um, if you're at home, think about your parents, your siblings, etc. Okay. Sometimes in families um, or marriages, basic skills like communication, problem solving, conflict resolution, they're weak or they're just non-existent. Often this is because both parents enter the marriage with wounds from their own families of origin. One of the first statements in this book says, a wounded person marries a wounded person and wounds their children. So similarly how I've said hurt people hurt people. Um, these past wounds can be triggered by their spouse or their children or a friend, etc., and they can react in a very unhealthy, with very unhealthy thoughts and actions. Without help, these parents pass their wounds on to their children, and the cycle of dysfunction continues as the sins of the father are passed on to the generation to come. So that is something you want to constantly be working at. You do not want to pass on these things um, to our children. The only way to do that is to break that cycle. All right. So what I hope to reveal to you is for you to start thinking about some of these negative things we do in our life, realize that we have hurts and wounds, and, and get those things healed so that we're not passing on and wounding our children. Um, Another thing to keep in mind as we think about this class being in terms of overcoming hurts and failures, think about failures here too, which if you remember from the very beginning, I kind of defined hurts as things done to you by another person, and failures are things that you sort of heap on yourself. It's almost like a wound, a self-imposed wound, okay, where you know, you just, you've messed up, all right? So think about that too as you go along because I believe sometimes when you fail or mess up, you could even overreact to that based on a past failure or a past time where you did not overcome that. And so that time you do it again, oh, I meant to tell you all last week when I'm mad at myself, I call myself Angela. Oh, Angela. Can I believe you did that? So if y'all start calling me Angela, I'm just going to start twitching or something because I'm like, that's my mean name for myself when I have negative self-talk, right? Um, anyway, so obviously there is hope. That's what this class is all about. Here we're going to learn that God heals those wounds and you can learn the necessary skills to build happy, healthy families and relationships. I love this verse, Jeremiah 30 and 17 says, I will restore health unto thee and heal thee of thy wounds. I absolutely love that because so much in this day and time, if you don't have those wounds healed, if you don't have those deep soul wounds healed, it can affect your health. It can affect your body. It can affect Stress alone can kill you over time, physically kill you. So I love that. That is God's intentions toward us, to restore us, to have good health, to be healed of our wounds. The problem is all of us Christian families here, we know this in our head, but sometimes we don't know it in our heart. So I'm going to read to you about the Smith family, all right? Bill Smith was the middle of three boys who were raised by a demanding, alcoholic father who was angry, critical, and abusive to his sons. Bill grew up feeling that nothing he ever did was good enough for his dad. Amy Smith, his wife, her father was a workaholic who spent little time or energy with his children. Bill and Amy had soul wounds 
from their childhood that were now affecting their marriage and their family life. The trouble with childhood soul wounds is that they cause us to internalize the negative messages of our parents and caretakers, and we begin to believe them. This is something that is really big. We hear negative messages, and before you know it, you're believing them, especially when a child hears these messages. It gets very ingrained in you. They almost become tattooed on our soul. The message that Bill's dad imprinted upon his psyche was, you are no good and you can't do anything right. The message that Amy's father, that Amy internalized from the neglect of her father was, you are not important, you are not valuable. Whenever Bill would withdraw from Amy in a conflict, she would feel that she was unimportant to him. Whenever Amy would nag or criticize Bill to get him to connect to her and the children, this would trigger the message of his soul wound, and he would feel like he couldn't do anything right. The very things that they were trying to do to heal their marriage were wounding each other in the same ways that they were wounded as children. So there's three concepts that you can keep in mind. And if you don't have a way to take notes, if you want to pull out your phone, that's fine. It's the one time I'm going to make the exception. I'm going to trust that all of you are not texting. But if you want to take notes, that's fine. Or just listen to it later and take notes then. But because I am going to throw out some very practical things that you can do. All right. So some th these three basic concepts can really help. And it's called mindfulness, intentionality, and sacrifice. Mindfulness is the state of being aware and attentive to your own soul wound as well as those around you or the members of your family. When someone triggers your soul wound, you must choose to self-soothe and ask the Lord to soothe your pain rather than becoming reactive. <coughs> Oh, that's so much harder to do than I just read. I just read that smooth sentence rather than becoming reactive. Okay, if you insist. Um, now, as you listen, I'm just going to, I'm not letting you off the hook for all of you sitting here going, well, I'm not volatile. I don't yell. I don't scream. I just withdraw. I just become silent. I just give the silent treatment. And that's better because those people that fly off the handle, they just, yeah. Uh-huh. I'm not going to let you off the hook. Okay? I'm not. Because while I will give you credit for that you usually regret less the things that you don't say <laughs> more than you regret the things you do say, However, that silent treatment and that withdrawal emotionally, withdrawal of your love, your affection, that has a lot of consequences to it as well. And it's just not healthy for family life, okay? So, now, I tend to be the volatile one in the household. Shocker, I know. Y'all thought Pastor was the one who freaks out, right? I know. It's hard to imagine that he's the quiet one. So I tend to gravitate when I'm talking on this subject, obviously, me being the one who's probably going to be the crazy yeller. Um, you know, we've had this conversation, and he doesn't get off the hook either if he withdraws, all right? So we're good, right? We got this straight. Yes, yeah, see, he's, he's in favor of this plan. Okay. So... When someone triggers it, you have to choose. Oh, key word is choose, okay? Now, I realize things happen in split seconds sometimes, and you're like, where's my phone? I got to find my notes. I'm supposed to be mindful right now. Like, what am I supposed to be doing? I understand. That's not going to happen. You're going to, I want you thinking about this. I want you, you know, praying about this, and I want you to just, here's what I want you to do. The next time something really gets you, really sets you off, just in a way that you're like, 
what is wrong with me? Why is this making me so crazy or so mad? What is this doing? Why am I reacting this way so strongly? That's the times. I want you to stop. I want you to try mindfulness. I want you to think about it. All right? I am proof that this works because I used a bunch of this as I was going through this, and it works. So one time Nathaniel came in, and he just starts talking to me just casually about a subject. Well, he had no idea that, like, I was having, like, internal, like, fireworks, like, like, Whatever the content was, I can't remember now, but it was something that like just triggered something in me. Like, what is he talking? This is, you know, and I'm just like, this is not right. This is not okay. Like, whatever. But I'm just listening. Uh huh. And then all of a sudden, my reaction actually comes out, and I'm like, why are you talking about this? This doesn't. And he stared at me, and like his face alone, like caused me to halt in my tracks. He's like what just happened <laughs> you know so he didn't know that like I'm having all these like mental gymnastics and by the time something came out of my mouth I was escalated like you know five octaves and his face literally was the very thing that caused me to stop in my tracks and go you know what I think I just overreacted there and of course he Thankfully, he's not a smart mouth, but he, I would have deserved like you think. Um, but that may have been another child in my house, but not this one. And so um, I just literally stopped and I just went in my room and was like, whoa, I need you to take a minute, Angie, and figure out what on earth just triggered that crazy reaction. So when I sifted through it and I was mindful of it, I figured out some things, and I prayed for the Lord to help me. So I'm just helping you to, that word mindful is really helpful. Like, whoa, pause, take a minute, and be mindful. Here's what it helps you to do. It helps you to be more compassionate, empathic, careful when relating to other family members, etc. being mindful of these things, all right? No, I don't want you to do that. Um, the next one is intentionality, becoming intentional about these reactions or lack thereof. Um, it's defined as the ability to act in a healing way, no matter how you feel. Whew. Everybody take a deep breath. Feel being the operative word. Feelings don't have to be true to be real. Okay. Oh, feelings are not always true, but they are very real. And so we have to really be intentional about not reacting out of feeling. In other words, you're going to put your feelings aside for the sake of the health in the home. All right? Did we not, we didn't say, so I'm not saying denying your feelings. That's not healthy. Denial is pretending that the situation is not difficult or painful, but you choose to give up your right to react, retaliate, or get even for the sake of having a healthy family relationship. Romans 12 and 1, we know this first by heart. Do not be conformed to this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Intentionality, you can think of that as renewing your mind with healing thoughts when your soul wound is triggered, all right? And then lastly is sacrifice. Sacrifice is when you're willing to give up your right, and that it's similar to intentionality, but it's really surrendering or giving up of something that's of such value to you for the sake of something having a higher or more pressing worth. Meaning your children, your children need to be worth more to you than you reacting and retaliating. And so it becomes a sacrifice that sometimes you have to give in family life in order to have healthy and godly interactions with one another. All right, so I'm going to dig into this. Everybody try to hang with me, all right? Is everybody ready? You're going to buckle your seatbelt. Have you ever wondered why you respond to certain situations in a particular way? Hmm, of course, we all have. Perhaps you overreact or become angry with your spouse and children, and like the Apostle Paul, you do the very thing that you hate. 
The Living Bible says it this way in Romans seven nineteen: When I want to do good, I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. This is where the failure piece comes in. Romans seven twenty four: What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? If you read through Romans 7, it's actually really encouraging because I feel like Paul is actually giving us so much hope for our failures and and really letting us know that we're not failures. He's going to say, you're going to fail. You're going to do things you don't want to do. You're going to not do things that you should do. You're going to fail. You're going to mess up, but there's hope. Because in verse 22 and 7, it says, For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me. So deep inside, I really want to do what God wants me to do. But then there's this other law that's waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. There again, what a wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body that's subject to death. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right? Here's the interesting thing about soul wounds is that these traumatic memories are not recorded or stored in the frontal lobe of your brain. All right? Now, there's people in this room way smarter than me. So, Sister Melissa McGurk, you can fact check me if you want to. She is smarter than me. Um... I am taking these people's word for it. I'm going to just tell you that plain and simple. They are smarter than me. They are psychologists. For everybody who's green in this room, you can do your own research because I didn't do all the research. It would take me forever to figure out if they are exactly, precisely correct when they talk about the brain. So I'm just making that clear. However, I'm trusting that these two psychologists know what they're talking about. Okay? So... I know, Christina, I see you laughing. She's like, "Mm mm-hmm, where'd she get her info from? This is not Wikipedia, okay. So here is where these traumatic wounds are stored, all right? They're recorded and stored. I'm sorry, they are not recorded and stored in the neocortex. I always say the frontal lobe. I have no idea if that's here. It just sounds like it's in the front. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to say, like, so every time I teach, I go, yeah, here. And then I'm like, I don't know if it's here, but it makes sense, right? If it says frontal, okay, yeah, front. Okay, good. So right here, the frontal lobe, the neocortex of the brain, they are not stored there, but instead they are stored in the cerebellum or what Sister Angie likes to call the trauma center. And you'll see why I call it the trauma center. All right, so they are stored in a different part of your brain. Now, let me explain the difference in the two parts of your brain. This is super simple, so don't freak out like, oh, I did not come for a, you know, biology lesson tonight or, you know, medical lesson. The neocortex, that front part, is the part of the brain that takes in information and draws rational conclusions, okay? Rational conclusions. This is where reasoning Judgment, complex cognitive behaviors, decision-making, self-evaluation, correct social behavior, that is where that's occurring. You're welcome, moms. I've just homeschooled your children for the day. All right. That is where all the rational parts, all that decision-making is happening in that neocortex. This part of your brain allows us to observe ourselves doing things from an an objective perspective. All right, but let's learn about the what I call that trauma center, the cerebellum, on the other hand. It's called the old brain because it is more rudimentary part of the brain and is very primitive in its functioning. It is the seat of primitive, powerful emotions, primitive being the key word, And it's where traumatic memory, those grooves, those wrinkles we're talking about, or the soul wounds are processed and stored. Hmm. It is also where the limbic system is located, and you will know this term, fight or flight. That is that system in your brain. That's where you have the fight or flight response when we perceive danger. All right, so hang with me. So when a traumatic childhood memory 
is triggered, we often feel this as danger, and we have a fight or flight response, even though the danger is not in the present. Huh. This is super interesting. It is to me. We humans are the only mammals that have a highly developed neocortex. Although other animals have a neocortex, particularly other primates, it is not as advanced and as functioning. So if you think about it, we always talk about how animals have a survival instinct. They have a very primitive brain that has that fight or flight in them, that survival instinct. Of course, we know our creator put it there. Since other mammals do not have that sophisticated frontal lobe, they depend more on their old brain, that cerebellum for functioning. Unfortunately, when it comes to traumatic memories, we humans often do the same thing. Why is this a problem? Hmm. Some of you have already figured it out. So unlike the neocortex, the old brain is formulating responses and behaviors by matching present patterns of sensory experience with past patterns. I know that sounded very, very smart. <laughs> That's why I didn't write that sentence. <laughs> Simple and primitive, here's what happens. It makes broad distinctions related to safety and survival that are not always accurate. All right? So when something is triggered from your childhood, our reactions don't always match up with what happened to you. So let me keep explaining. It is unable to make subtle distinctions according to the circumstances, and it's that knee-jerk response that is typically blown out of proportion to the current stimuli. These extreme survival responses become ingrained as they are recorded and stored where? In the same place, in our old brain, thus creating unhealthy, habituated responses from us. It's really amazing, and this is an amazing thing. Our creator made this brain and it's really interesting, but this is how I know you can get healed. He also knows how to heal that brain. But sometimes we have to retrain it a little bit, and that's what you're going to learn in this session. But it's also about healing, all right, healing that soul wound and retraining our brain. So an example of this would be the combat veteran who relives his trauma when he hears a car backfire, all right? Very simple example of that. Um, people who have a great deal of rejection from their past could overreact by the slightest frown from someone. All right? So can you see how this connects, how we react sometimes to situations? To the old brain, all threats can be life-threatening. All right? So your brain is shooting this into your, you know, it's telling your mind that, it's telling yourself that, Danger, 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 when it's actually very disproportionate to what's actually going on, therefore why there's times that we completely overreact to a situation. The more past trauma that you have, the more you can overreact to real or perceived trauma that's in the present. So let's just pause and think about this for a minute. Um, if you remember back to my original story, I think it was the first night, um, and, and honestly, this has helped me so much because when I told you that I was like having this breakdown on Christmas Eve and I'm like freaking out and I don't know what's wrong with me, I'm all a big mess. And, you know, my husband very kindly suggested, he didn't kindly demand Brother um, Ingblom, he kindly suggested um, that maybe I take a minute to myself, all right? And so... I remember stopping and thinking, whoa, I need to stop and be mindful right now. I, I need to sit here and think about what it is that is affecting me, I, that's causing me to act like this. And I really couldn't do it by myself. I really couldn't get a handle on it. So what did I do? I prayed. I just 
got on my face. I told you guys this in my closet, on my face. I started weeping and I just started praying, why God am I acting like this? And that's when God like peeled back that layer and showed me of a time in which I was abandoned as a child, or at least a perceived abandonment. Um, and so I did what I'm going to tell you that you should do when you start to realize that and and think about the person that hurt you. Then I started forgiving again. Had I already forgiven my dad for that? I had. I thought I had. But you know what? I just figure, why not forgive again? You know, as it hits your brain, why not just forgive again? I mean, it's definitely not going to hurt you. <laughs> if anything, it'll just keep that healing balm flowing, that oil. It just keeps it flowing. And so if you think about it, that's exactly what was happening to me, was I was overreacting, and I had to really stop. And I will tell you that when you take this stuff to God, he is so good at revealing to you. You don't need a psychiatrist's couch, and you don't need hypnosis. We have a God who knows us. He made us. He knows what happened. He was there every step of the way in your life. He can show you what happened and how it's wounded you and why you're acting the way you are. I, I'm telling you, so many times in my life, God has just shown me in such a gentle way and just said, just, you know what? This is what I see. And, and sometimes, I'll be honest, like in prayer even, I've almost like had a... Um, like where I'm out on the outside looking in, and it's like I see myself in the situation and it playing out, and God kind of shows me. And like, like I said, like I looked back on that where I perceived it as abandonment. I said before, like God really showed me. Well, but my dad was just doing the best he could. He, he didn't realize he was not thinking I'm going to abandon my kids on Christmas Eve. It was his time to give us up and send us to our mom's house. So like, but see, but we have these childhood memories. And I do want to pause here and urge you that when you think back over your life and you have something like a particular thing that you just like can't get over, what I want to urge you to do is look back through the eyes of an adult. All right. Look back as who you are right now. Not through the eyes of that child, that child that was hurt or traumatized at 8 or 10 or 12, because that child didn't have a fully developed brain, didn't know how to perceive everything that was going on. And so things happen to children, and they perceive it all wrong. But see, if you can go back and kind of look back at it, and you go, oh, okay, wow, I don't actually think that's what was going on at all. But because, like, you know, I'm a mom now, and I realize, you know, I remember thinking, like, I hated my mom for yelling and screaming. And um, and she was always very volatile. And she, thank God, she never hurt any of us children. But, but she was just always that, just really would get upset and, like, really just fly off. And, um, and I remember just being so bitter, towards her for that until I had four little cherubs of my own probably started with the two little cherubs um, but then once I got to four wow it takes a lot of self-control and a lot of Jesus to not just react I mean there's some days I'm like they're out to get me I know they wake up and they have a meeting in their room in the morning and they conspire and devise ways in which they're going to torment me I was convinced of that some days and no not at all <laughs> that's not what was happening but it felt like that so you know guess what it was like one day I like hear myself yelling at all of them and I like how, what is the famous, I sound just like my mother. Wow. Okay. So do I keep being mad at her or do I just let it go and realize, guess what? She had three small girls who were crazy. I was the craziest. She had three small girls in four years' time. 
So she had her hands full. So, you know, it's moments like that. See, that's looking back through the eyes of an adult and going, wow, like I really get it now. So I I think I'm going to show a little mercy here, you know. So I just want to kind of throw that out to you. So I want to keep going about some other things that are fascinating about your brain. Another factor about the old brain, all right, that trauma center is that it has no sense of time, which means a person can experience a traumatic soul wound at age five and it be triggered at age 35. You can feel the same intense emotions that you had as a child. The problem is that the individual is probably not in the same amount of risk or danger. Remember at how a child perceives danger and a trauma and a wound, how a child gets wounded, it's much more extreme than what's currently happening when your husband or wife, you know, just does something wrong, just looks at you the wrong way or just doesn't do the dishes or just, you know, whatever. See what I'm saying? So these things become so disproportionate to what is actually happening in the current moment, but maybe it triggers these feelings that you, ha- that you had as a child. So your old brain overreacts. A person, so in a good example too, for you to understand this, is a person that's burned in a fire when he's four years old, as an adult, he still has that same fight or flight response when he smells smoke. So it's a very physical way for you to think about it. It's very similar. But what happens when your childhood wounds are triggered and when your childhood wounds are triggered, you can overreact in much the same way. You know, you're not going to yell somebody who's freaking out when they smell smoke, fire, fire, oh my God, you know, and you're, whoa, somebody just lit a match. Like, what is wrong with you? Like, We're not going to judge that person. We're not going to be harsh and rude and mean, especially when they divulge. Our house burned down when I was four years old, and I was trapped, and the firemen had to come rescue me. I mean, you're going to sit there, and you're going to be like, whoa, like that's heavy, and you're like, you feel really bad for judging that person for being so reactive. It's the same kind of thing. Um, And honestly, the more you learn that, oh, my goodness, the better off you are. We're not supposed to judge one another, right? We're not supposed to compare ourselves among ourselves, judge ourselves to one another. So it's just, it's really important, these things. It's important to be, to be kind and gracious and gentle when we're dealing with these things. What if they are inflicted by those that are closest to you? So what if your soul wounds, what if it's not being burned in a fire, but it's a soul wound that's emotional in nature, and it was inflicted by someone closest to you, like your mother or father? Those wounds can be triggered by those closest in your adult life, your spouse, your children. This explains why there's so much volatility in families. It really does. Frequently, people are angrier with their spouses and children than they were with their parents. So, you know, this happens all the time. This is because as children, it was taboo to express that anger towards your parent. But as an adult, they do not have as many sanctions on your emotions. And so you feel more freedom to let the toxic feelings out. Oh, my goodness. So you've got that five-year-old who's hurt or traumatized, wounded, but knows, I better not say a word. I'm going to be smacked in the face. I'm going to, I can't react to this. I can't, they internalize it. Fast forward 30 years, it explodes out of you because there's no, there's no sense of time in this place in your brain. It's just telling you, danger, 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 and you explode, but completely unsanctioned (laughs) with no, nothing, you know, holding you back this time. You finally get to just unleash, you know, all those feelings that were pent up. So it's super interesting. I don't know about y'all, but I'm super interested in this. When something triggers you, you may not be outwardly, oh, I already said all that. Sorry, I was thought I was still reading the book. Um... 
This can also be called putting your parent's face on your partner. So that is something that another psychologist has kind of coined that phrase, putting your parent's face on your partner. So I'm going to wrap up with this where the psychology meets the biblical truths. What do I do when I'm triggered? What am I supposed to do? So I said in the beginning, a combination of things could possibly be the key, or it could just be go straight to prayer and ask the Lord to help you and reveal it and heal you. I absolutely 100% believe you can do that, and God will meet you there. Sometimes things are harder to get over, okay? So you might need to stop and be mindful and use those tools. Be mindful, be intentional, and exert some sacrifice. <laughs> I mean, imagine that, that Jesus is asking us to sacrifice a little bit of ourselves for the sake of the well-being of our family, but here's four R's that they recommend in this healing process and I think will help you. One is return. Find your way back to God. So sometimes these wounds are so intense that it pulls us further and further away from God. All right? And you don't even realize it. You've pushed God away. You've said, no, I don't want to deal with it. don't want to deal with it. You've done all those things. Return. Go back to your first love and Find your way back to God. And repent. Why do we repent? Why? Because my thoughts is, according to Brother Hurt, <laughs> repent. Ask God to forgive you for overreacting and acting like a you know crazy person or withdrawing. Forgive, Jesus, forgive me for treating people this way. Forgive me for for acting in such a way that's so unpleasing to you. See, this is acknowledging and owning our stuff, but you're owning it to God, and you're just saying, forgive me, Jesus. And then secondarily in that, forgive the person who wounded you. And like I said before, that forgiving 70 times 7, I've often said, I believe it's not like how many times like 490 people are going to wound me or hurt me and I have to forgive 490 people. I believe it's more so saying as things happen over and over again, as your onion gets peeled back and you go, whoa, like I'm still really bitter about the situation or this person or this. And so forgive again. Like I said, I thought I'd forgiven all the things I could think of with my dad, but guess what I did? I forgave again. And I was specific with God. You know what? I forgive my dad for abandoning me. And forgive me, Jesus, for being so bitter towards him and, and just judging him for where he was at. I was, I judged him. That's what I was doing. And so repentance and forgiveness often go hand in hand. You repent and you forgive. And then this renew and restore phase can come in. And that is where you're praying for Jesus to heal you. Now, sometimes you might need help. Sometimes this might be at an altar with, you know, a son of oil, a minister of oil to your wound. And sometimes that could be the pastor with the actual oil. Sometimes it can just be another elder or a best friend. But it can be really helpful if you feel like you need help in praying for these wounds or something specific, then ask Jesus to heal you. Try to be specific. And if you're not sure, there again, just pray and ask him to reveal it to you. Find a safe person and a close person that you can, that can help you through this. And finally, the last R is rejoice. Thank God for all that he's done for you. And remind yourself what the word of God says about you. Be thankful. God is so good. He is so ready and willing to heal us. He wants us whole. He wants our families whole. He wants us to have positive, encouraging interaction with one another. He wants to heal you so that you don't hurt those people that you're working with, your children, your spouse, anybody, I, you know, in ministry. Ministers have been known to hurt people, you know, because wounds get stirred up and they react and they hurt people. And that's just not the will of God. God wants us to be healed. Healed people 
heal people. And so that's what I pray um, for our families. Why don't we all stand for a moment and let's just, as you think about all that I've said, and if you're even thinking about maybe the way your parents treated you and you're thinking, whoa, you know, my parents were trigger happy. <laughs> they were very triggered by everything. Um, you know, whatever it is in your life, whatever it is you're thinking about, if you're thinking about yourself, let's just take just a moment here. I don't want to, it's not going to be long and drawn out because I want you to take this, absorb it, and in your own time, you and Jesus work on this. But let's just pray for a moment for the Lord to help us to heal us. Lord Jesus, I thank you right now that you are a healing God. You don't want to just heal us physically, God, but you want to heal our wounds, the deep soul wounds in our lives, things that have been done to us by people, things that have impacted the way we respond and react to our family members. God, I pray right now that you would reveal to us, Jesus, those wounds Show us, God, when we're triggered by things, God, and help us to take it to you, to repent, to forgive those that have hurt us, to trust you with our lives, God. Help us to trust you as a good, good father who only wants what's best for us, that you want to heal us and make us whole. We give this to you, Lord God, and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. Oh, we thank you for your unconditional love. We thank you, Jesus, for loving us when we didn't even deserve it. We thank you for it, Lord God. I thank you for your healing power that is alive and well in this world today, God. I pray that every one of us could be healed and whole so that we can share this with other people, with a hurting world that needs to be healed. God, I pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.